The relationship of the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas to the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine, play a very important role in digestion. So let's look at the anatomy of the liver first. And the liver is drained by the right and left hepatic ducts, which lead into the common hepatic duct. And the liver plays the most significant role in digestion of the lipids because it produces the bile, which is then stored in the gallbladder. And everything then drains into the duodenum through the um, hepatopancreatic ampulla and sphincter. The sphincter is the whole, is the name for the whole basically, where the valve is located. And this first section is the entire length of the duodenum. It's the, the shortest section of the small intestine. The second part is the jejunum. And then the last, the most distal part of the small intestine is referred to as the ileum. So the next slide shows bile and pancreatic secretion into the, the small intestine. So the bile duct and the pancreatic duct unite in lead into the wall of the duodenum and it fuses into a bulb-like structure which is called the hepatopancreatic ampulla and then into the hepatopancreatic sphincter. The sphincter is the region that controls the entry of the bile and the pancreatic juice into the duodenum like basically like a valve. So a couple really important hormonal controls to know are cholecystokinin, CCK, and secretin. The important thing to remember about uh, CCK is that it's released when there is fatty chyme that's present in the duodenum, and that goes into the bloodstream and has an effect on the gallbladder and causes the gallbladder to release the bile that is being stored there. The secretin causes more bile production from the liver. So our next slide continues this and describes further regulation of the bile and the pancreatic secretions. And the bile secretion it's increased when there is hepato or enterohepatic circulation returning large amounts of bile salts. So it's kind of like a feedback mechanism. It's increased when there is secretin from the intestinal cells that's exposed to hydrochloric acid and fatty chyme. And the result is that the hepatopancreatic sphincter is closed unless digestion is active. So the mechanisms that lead to this are shown in this slide. And when we first look at number one on the left-hand side of this diagram, shows us secretin and CCK are secreted by the duodenal enteroendocrine cells. And enteroendocrine refers to hormones that are released into the bloodstream, as we can see shown by these two different colors, uh, kind of this uh, orange color and red color molecules to signify uh, CCK and secretin. And they're characterized in the following four steps. The next step is that the pancreatic secretion is going to increase and the CCK specifically induces secretion by the ACE and R cells of the enzyme-rich pancreatic juice. And the secretin causes secretion by ducts cells of bicarbonate-rich pancreatic juice, which, remember, is alkaline, and it has a higher pH to sort of buffer the acidic effect of the chyme that travels from the stomach into the duodenum. There's also a weaker effect by the vagus nerve because the vagus nerve, remember, is the primary um, parasympathetic nerve for digestion. The next step is biosecretion by the liver. So this is kind of an, 
an additional effect that bile has by acting on the fat that's present, the fatty chyme. Gallbladder, the gallbladder contracts, which is result, the result of the CCK being secreted into the blood. And then finally, the hepatopancreatic sphincter relaxes and causes the hepatopancreatic sphincter to open. Bile and pancreatic juice then can enter the duodenum to kind of conclude the digestion of the fatty molecules that are in the small intestine, specifically the duodenum. So the small intestine, it's now the, it's the major organ of digestion and absorption. So there is some absorption that happens in the stomach, but it's primarily going to be water that's absorbed there. And um, there is digestion, though, that occurs before that. But the primary site of nutrient absorption is going to be in the small intestine, specifically the duodenum. Water and fats, they are passively absorbed, but everything else is going to um, require the use of energy. So the small intestine itself is about 2 to 4 meters long, 7 to 13 feet long, from the pyloric sphincter to the ileocecal valve. The pyloric sphincter is at the distal end of the stomach, between the stomach and the small intestine. And then the ileocecal valve is between the ileum and the cecum, the first part of the large intestine. So the three different subdivisions of the small intestine include the duodenum. It's a short part, only about 10 inches long, and it's mostly retroperitoneal in location. The jejunum is a bit longer, 8 feet long. And then finally, the ileum is the longest part. The blood supply would be the uh, superior mesenteric artery bringing blood supply to it. And then the veins are what drains nutrient-rich blood into eventually the portal, hepatic portal vein, also sometimes just, refer, sometimes just simply referred to as the portal vein. So we see here on this diagram the location of the small intestine from the anatomy, so the, the shorter duodenum, jejunum, and then the ileum. Microscopically, some of the additional adaptations of the small intestine include the uh, fact that there's three primary modifications. The first is called the circular folds. These are also called plique circularis. The second is the villi. These are finger-like projections of the mucus. They're microscopic structures that increase surface area to increase the absorption of food. And then finally, the microvilli are cytoplasmic extensions of the mucosal cells that are on the that make up the entire villus. So there's a very large increase of surface area. In fact, it's a surface area of about 600 times about the size of a tennis court, so an extreme increase in surface area. And this is so beneficial because it allows for more monomers, nutrients, to be absorbed into the blood. So the next slide shows us how these look anatomically the three different structural modifications. And we first see the circular folds, again, also called the plique circularis. Those individual finger-like projections that form those are called villi. And then on each individual villus are additional cells that are referred to as the microvilli. And this is sometimes described as the brush border because it looks histologically almost like brush strokes. So in the image to the right, we can see a microscopic image of the villus. So our next slide is describing this histology 
of the small intestine. So we talked about the duodenum and how Im very important the it is for absorption. However, the um, remaining parts of the small intestine are also very important, but for other purposes. For example, the, um, there are specific cells called panath cells that are found deep in the crypts. And they're specialized secretory cells that help to provide uh, intestinal defenses. Specifically, they secrete antimicrobial agents called defensins and lysozymes. And then at the distal end of the small intestine, which would be the ileum, there are specialized lymphoid nodules that you learned about in the lymphatic system called Peyer's patches. So the digestive processes in the small intestine include um, essentially the absorption of the chyme that comes in from the stomach. So the chyme, when it, it goes from the stomach into the small intestine, it is partially digested. So there are some final enzymes that finish the digestive process. Those are those brush border enzymes. And then it takes about three to six hours in the small intestine to absorb all the nutrients and most of the water. So the sources for this digestion are substances like the bile for fat, bicarbonate digestive enzymes, in addition to um, brush border enzymes. So these enzymes are separate. They're in the pancreatic juice. So chyme is specially regulated as far as how much travels from the stomach into the small intestine. And it's all controlled by what's called the enterogastric reflex. There are hormones called enterogastrones, specifically the CCK and the secretin that control movement of the food into the duodenum. So the motility of the small intestine includes segmentation. And segmentation is the most common motion of the small intestine. There's actually nerve cells in the small intestine that control this. Mixes and moves context back, contents towards the ileocecal valve. And then between meals, there is peristalsis. And this peristalsis increases. Um, it's initiated by the hormone motilin in the late intestinal phase. So every one and a half to two hours. So there's a complete trip from the duodenum to the ileum that takes about two hours. And then finally, at the very end of the small intestine is the ileocecal valve where the ileocecal sphincter relaxes and then it is going to allow the chyme to go into the large intestine.